I think when I was young, when I was a teenager, I loved to travel. I had an obsession with, with traveling. And I think that the camera became a sort of passport, a way to explore the world and, and to try to understand the world that I hadn't grown up with. That's where my passion began. It, it sort of took me to different cultures, to different peoples, um, and to different places. And, and that's always been with me, that sense of sort of adventure and of walking and of exploring. And the camera was a mechanism for that um, from a very early age. I'm Stuart Franklin. Photography has a mission, as an eyewitness account serving to raise human consciences and pose questions of vital importance. Stuart Franklin has never stopped documenting the various aspects of nature in its values and principles, but most of all in its complex relationship with man. His field of action is the whole world, explored with his camera, but even before that, studied at Oxford at the Faculty of Geography. His absolute references and the values concealed in every shot are, instead, those of Magnum Photos. Magnum had an enormous role in my life and work. I mean, I've been with Magnum for nearly 30 years. So There's an awful lot of time, and it's, a, it's kind of a family, and it's a cooperative. Magnum began in 1947, really, to try to sort of um, promote the idea that, that we, the photographers, own our own copyright. We own our own work, and that's very important. Apart from that, I think there was a great sort of collegiate, and there still is, collegiate atmosphere in, in Magnum. We share a lot, um, we're quite critical, we look. And, um, and even at our annual meeting at the end of the year, you know, we quite often show work to other people and talk about it. And I think the feedback is, is, is formidable. Among Stuart Franklin's photo features on human conurbations and the wonders of the planet, there is, however, one photo symbol, which will go down in history in the memory of that Chinese spring of 1989 that would mark a turning point in the communist dictatorship. The peaceful demonstrations of the students had begun in April, after the death of Hu Yaobang, as a simple commemoration of the beloved reformist leader of the party. And yet the authorities, led by President Li Pang and the elderly leader Dang Xiaoping, immediately accused the students of plotting against the government. Not much time would go by before the repression succeeded in silencing once and for all the mottos and slogans of hundreds of young demonstrators. We had a very sort of charismatic um, editorial director in Magnum in New York, Bob Danin, and he and I remember having quite a few discussions about the sort of emerging situation in China and it was quite clear to anybody who knew anything of Chinese history that to oppose the government in the way that the students and workers were at that time was pretty significant news. It was very unusual, you know, this is a very homogenous, um, co cohesive society and so something must have been badly wrong for, you know, the brightest, some of the brightest and best of that society to um, gather in Tiananmen Square and um, oppose uh, the regime through demonstrations and then a hunger strike and so forth. So um, uh, Bob 
Dan in Magnum asked me to go and to try to cover the news. And uh, I started really to try to capture um, the story as it unfolded in its different in its different ways and, and every day was different. I mean, one day I would go to the university where they were printing pamphlets. Um, another day I would go and look at, you know, a small demonstration being prepared somewhere else, a Statue of Liberty and so on and so forth. So there are many sort of aspects to the story, but the nearer we got to June the 3rd, 4th, um, the more the atmosphere changed. When I arrived in um, Beijing, it was more like, um, uh, sort of a little bit like a rock festival in atmosphere. The, um, they were playing the Marseillaise, um, singing, there was a lot of music, but at the same time there was, you know, a hunger strike going on on the side of the square, but then more and more soldiers arrived and the situation became um, more and more tense and uncertain. There were rumours flying around about, you know, the Chinese army or various elements of the Chinese army uh, opposing other elements and so on, and sort of the sense that eventually people would be cleared um, from the square. Um, so the days went on and I photographed and uh, tried to send pictures back to, to Paris. Like many other Magnum photographers, Stuart Franklin got his start in areas of extreme poverty and distress, documenting famines, conflicts, and the complexities of human existence. I suppose the most instructive were the work I did in during the 1983-84 famine where in, uh, in Sudan and Ethiopia where I really understood um, how difficult it was to communicate the very complex crisis that was happening in Africa at that time using photography. Uh, it was very tough to, I mean, it's all very well to take one photograph that tells the story about somebody um, suffering from famine. It's much harder to tell a bigger story about why a famine is happening, what's happening there. And there was no shortage of food in uh, the Horn of Africa at that time, but it was all being diverted to the Ethiopian army at the time. How can you tell that story coherently uh, as a photographer? So I sort of had to deal with challenges like that. I think the other thing I learned in covering war is that, um, is that I'm not, not this kind of brave, uh, <laughs> courageous, uh, photojournalist, as, as many of my colleagues at the time were, I, I just got very, very scared uh, in, you know, quite difficult situations. It is awful, you know, to put yourself in harm's way in that way. And a lot of my colleagues were just uh, extraordinarily tough and brave. I also learned that a lot of the more powerful, the most powerful images of conflict come not from the front line, not from being at the front line, but perhaps being a few feet back, a few meters back, and looking at how the women and children are coping, how the families are coping, how people are coping at a time generally of tragedy. <laughs> The night between the 3rd and the 4th of June, the tanks of the Chinese government entered the Tiananmen Square to put an end to the protests. The order is to clear the square by dawn, at all costs. The night will go by quickly, amidst the flames and the echoes of shots, with the spilling of the blood of hundreds of young victims. Even their parents, will be savagely mowed down by the soldiers' guns when they arrived in the square the next morning in search of their children. I went back to the hotel and, and uh, stayed uh, for a few hours in the hotel. By that time, the bottom level, the, the lobby of the hotel, had been taken over by the um, sort of Chinese uh, internal security people and they were sort of searching for cameras and it generally became uh, very difficult to, to work after that and in fact impossible to leave the hotel. Um, so the following morning 
I found myself stuck really in my room wondering when there was going to be a knock um, on the door and you know a whole bunch of people asking for film asking for the cameras and so on um, but anyway we found a balcony and started to photograph the sort of movement of the tanks um, coming out of the square uh, from, um, from, from the balcony, uh, which wasn't very satisfactory. We'd much rather been down on the street, but we couldn't, couldn't get out. I tried to sort of photograph everything as it happened. There was a row of students facing off a row of soldiers at one point, probably at about nine o'clock in the morning. They were dispersed and then the tanks uh, sort of forced their way through the students uh, down towards almost just below um, my uh, balcony where I was photographing. And, uh, and then, as you say, this lone protester jumped out from the crowd and started remonstrating with the tank driver climbed on top of the tank, came back down with his shopping bag uh, in images that you know everybody's seen. Um, I felt at the time that you know it, it wasn't very powerful as a photograph. I felt you know we'd always grown up with the view, I think it was Robert Kappa's um, quote that you know if a picture isn't good enough you're not close enough and I, I felt you know a, a long way away and I have these sort of strong memories of you know, the, the famous pictures of um, the um, Prague Spring of the, the Russian tanks coming in and so on and so forth. So I was a long way away trying to capture what I felt was a significant event. I did manage to do that later in the morning. We went out, we got out, we got away, uh, and we visited a couple of hospitals. Um, but so what I did was I photographed the scene as I saw it, uh, the, the demonstrator coming out. Um, arguing with the tank driver, being sort of taken to the other side of the street by his colleagues, and then the tanks carrying on um, moving forward. Um, so that's how that sort of morning um, happened. As was the case during the Tiananmen Square uprisings, the human factor will be at the center of every one of Stuart Franklin's photo reports. In tragedies like that documented a few years earlier at the Hazel Stadium during the European Cup final between Juventus and Liverpool. Or like the simple telling of paradoxical stories often reported as curiosity items in magazines, but which take on a different light and particular appeal in his photos. Like the feature on Julia Hill, the American girl who will live for more than a year in a huge sequoia tree in an attempt to save it from being felled. I think that our physical relationship with, with other people in society, with, you know, from, from our very earliest beginnings in the womb to being babies and young children, moments that, you know, most of us have completely forgotten, but our brains haven't forgotten them, our subconscious hasn't forgotten the kind of the, our engagement with each other, with 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 our parents, with um, you know siblings, if we have them, and I think that that very sort of physical um, connection uh, informs a lot of the way we work, and certainly informs the way I photograph. I've recently been um, working a lot in landscape, and one of the sort of interest for me is to what extent, as to why I'm interested in, in particular aspects of the landscape, why I abstract in particular ways. I, I think Merleau-Ponty said once, we see the world through the spectacles of memory. And I think that almost everything uh, I, I see comes or, 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 or experience or get excited about, it peaks some kind of memory in, in, in me in some way. And, and that might just be a line, you know, some form in the landscape might be the form of, you know, a face or an arm or, or something. But I think we, we, we find these um, reminders of our memory quite comforting and interesting. So, how's it going? 
fine, so looking a little bit too contrasty, so I'm, I'm taking the grade down just to, to get a bit more tonality in. Well, luckily you printed this one before. Yeah, we yeah, had it for the Edinburgh show, yeah. So, so let's but, uh, just do the beginning. Out in the cold North Sea. It's been a glorious day out there. Hasn't it? What, today? Yeah, oh God. 25 degrees, I think. So when was this taken again? This was, this oh, was quite, quite some time ago. 1980 something, 1987, I think. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, and this was a, a sort of corporate job or? Yeah, it was a calendar uh, for an oil company. Of course, the other thing is you, you're shooting on film and um, so there's no preview. There's yeah, always, yeah. Okay, so just a little bit burning in on the left hand side. I love the atmosphere, the sort of mist sort yeah, of coming yeah. off of the... Yeah, no, you've worked that really well, as ever. It's fantastic. Yeah. You didn't get as far as going in yourself, <laughs> did you? <laughs> How's that looking? I think, well, you should never judge under red light, but I think it might just need just a bit more density. Yeah, yeah, it's working well. Yeah, it's a lovely print. Well, at least it looks well. well. Get the lights on. Right. Never allowed to judge under that light. <laughs> yeah. Flights. Okay, dokie. Okay. What have we got here? Yeah, that's good, isn't it? It's looking better. And the Edinburgh stuff looks so good on the wall. The contact sheet, literally speaking, is when you put you know, a strip of negatives uh, in contact with a piece of photographic paper, burn the light through the negatives onto the paper. That's, you know, it's the strict order of a roll of film. I took a much sort of broader uh, view of what a, what a contact sheet should be, and that is really a sort of more or less narrative sequence of photographs um, around the particular event, which was the, um, the protester um, jumping in front of the tanks. So, so the whole contact sheet traces, you know, the journey of the tanks down from the square. You can see the square, you can see the line of protesters, and then you can see the events as we know at the end. Television killed photojournalism in the print journalism sense of the word, virtually. I mean, it's still, you know, on, a, on life support, but it's basically sort of dead, in, in my view. So I suppose what, what television killed to some degree was the photo essay, the, the long run of photographs. Um, and what we're talking just now about is the single photograph of a man defying the row of tanks. I've said in, 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 in many interviews before that it was television that made that photograph, if it is iconic, iconic. It was television that sort of got people engaged with that sort of ballad, if you like, in front of the, the tanks. And, um, you know, it, it became symbolic. The still photograph, the photograph I took and two or three other people took, became almost a sort of a souvenir uh, from the um, from the television footage, it, it became a symbolic thing. Because I think what what we always have tried to do, uh, anybody that's photographed in the news, news is very complicated, um, is to sort of crystallise in one photograph uh, something essential about the event or the day and so on. And but I think what really drove it to become, if you like, a famous photograph was the initial coverage it got on television. Uh, the BBC were in the building, I think CNN were in the building. I, I can't remember which, which crews were there, French TV. But it, it, you know, and then I remember Magnum ringing me and saying, did you get this or that? And yes, I got that photograph.
As was the case during the Tiananmen Square uprisings, the human factor will be at the center of every one of Stuart Franklin's photo reports. In tragedies, like that documented a few years earlier at the Hazel Stadium, during the European Cup final between Juventus and Liverpool. Or like the simple telling of paradoxical stories, often reported as curiosity items in magazines, but which take on a different light and particular. I'm interested as a photographer in capturing the relationship between man and nature. Uh, man is part of an evolving, changing species, homo sapiens, changing all the time. Probably I see mankind as becoming more and more sort of powerful in determining the future of the planet in perhaps a way that didn't exist 500 years ago. So I suppose, you know, it is within our power how the planet will continue to sustain itself. So The Time of Trees was the first book uh, I published and um, it started in Malaysia and um, I w went to Sarawak, you know, half of Borneo if you like, and I was just completely shocked by the extent of rainforest destruction. I took light planes up into the sky and I could see that where even the Malays were saying there was forest, there was none. It had been felled and you could hear and see it all around you. Um, and at the back end of that, people were suffering from flooding, uh, from all kinds of problems caused by the rainforest destruction. So I'm, I wanted to sort of um, continue to, to look at uh, what man and nature meant to each other. <laughs> I'd been fortunate in that during my sort of 15 or 20 years of working with National Geographic I'd done a number of urban stories, uh, some on mega cities, some on smaller cities and so on and so forth, that I was able to sort of piece together uh, this jigsaw or, or, or at least answer in certain ways this question, you know, and I think my conclusion was that cities are, you know, are positive things and, and for, for, for us, for humans, they are sites of opportunity and also for invention, you know, and for in, innovation. You know, a lot of the things that we create and innovate are, are, are made in, in cities. So, so I've always held that view that people are always trying to better their circumstances.